Hello, and welcome to the special launch episode of YTV. Every Sunday at 5 p.m., we'll broadcast what you need to know from this week's news on campus and around the world. We also bring you original broadcast reporting on the biggest stories and sit down one-on-one -on -one with world and campus figures to get the inside story. It's your Yale, your week, your news, and we are YTV. to YTV. I'm Raleigh Cavero. And I'm Madison Allworth. Our cover story today, the lowest admission rate in Yale history for the class of 2017. A mere 6.72% of applicants heard the Eli Yale acceptance song as they opened their decision emails, according to Dean of Undergraduate Admissions Jeffrey Brenzel. That's about 2,000 accepted out of 30,000 applicants. For early action applicants, the admit rate climbed to 14.4%. As application rates have skyrocketed, admission rates at Yale and similar institutions have plummeted since 2010. In a Thursday press release, Brenzel said they had another extraordinary applicant pool and called the selection process challenging. For the lucky few who were accepted, Jen Kramer brings us more information about how to make the decision between Ivy League schools. She took a trip across the Ivy League to speak with student leaders about their respective schools and the college decision-making process. Jen? In just a few days, prospective college students worldwide will rush to their mailboxes, refresh their email inboxes, all hoping for those precious, rumored, big envelopes. And as current high school seniors open these envelopes and prepare to make their college decisions, we're here at Harvard Yard, wrapping up this week's whirlwind trip around the Ivy League. At Harvard and at other top schools, we ask current students, what's it really like to be here? What is being at Harvard like in one adjective? It's crazy. Uh, I'm at the law school, so the word that comes to mind is maybe competitive, but there's like, there's this subversive artsy scene. It's pretty insane. It's a lot more work than I thought it'd actually be, but it's a lot of fun too. What is it like to be a student at Brown? It is amazing. Everybody here is really into something. Yeah. That's for sure. Passionate, not forced. But then at the end of the day, like... They're like secret superhumans. <laughs> yeah. Here. Brown's a really liberal place. Brown is like the red-haired stepsister of the Ivy League. <laughs> What's it like to be a Princeton student? It's a lot of fun. The people here are just unbelievably awesome. I would say eye-opening. Inspiring. Stressful. Orange. How would you describe life at Yale? It is... Really? Frickin'... Yeah, great people, smart people, fun people, interesting people. There's so many different kinds of people and so many different um, like backgrounds. It's got lots of old buildings that aren't actually old. Like? Columbia in one word. Philosophical. Stressful. <laughs> Eclectic. Uh, hustly. Full of bookworms going to Butler on any given day and you literally can't find a seat anywhere. So what is it like to be a Penn student? Um, it's really busy all the time, and my favorite part is definitely being in Philadelphia. There's always something going on if you want to go out and have a good time. It's allowed me to do things that I would have never been able to do elsewhere. In terms of academics, you're always in an environment of very intelligent people. One word. Tradition. Home. Jewish. <laughs> I mean four words. Work hard, play hard. Work hard, play harder. At these top schools, there are seemingly endless opportunities to dive into campus life. And when info sessions, tours, and websites blend together, distinguishing between schools can be a challenge. So we chat with student leaders at each Ivy about how they approached the college decision-making process. Coming from high school, you don't really know what college is actually going to be like. You have this like idea like that it could be like Animal House or it could be like people studying like in a an arcane like 1960s film in the library of like you know Harvard Law or something but it, it all is I think 
all new. And so in that way, I kind of went into it with an open expectation. I applied through a program called QuestBridge, which is an organization that helps low-income students. So I applied early through that program and ranked Princeton as one of the schools. I, I did a big spring break tour um, touring the different colleges. Um, so I did MIT's Advent Weekend. I, I stopped by NYU for a while, Columbia. At the end of the day, it was Columbia being in New York and that translating into there are a lot more opportunities. The problem that I had was I could actually see myself at every one of the schools, but I just, I had to go through and sort of rely on intangibles. So how do these Ivies set themselves apart in a group where every campus has the best? It's a place where you really have to sort of make your own opportunities and kind of, kind of go out there and be a go-getter and, and um, figure things out. You have to figure things out. And so because of that, you will be a different person in four years than you were when you first got here. You have no choice. I've never been in a place where people are so different and everything is okay. I mean, you could identify as whatever you want to identify as. The eating clubs are pretty much the central hub of all social life on campus, which has its pros and cons. I would say the eating club is definitely something that I don't think you really understand until you actually come to Princeton. And the nice thing though is that once you're here, you can choose whether or not you're gonna be in an eating club. And even though most students are, I wouldn't say it has a negative effect on your experience if you choose not to be in one. Some of my favorite things are how specialized the schools are. You, you, you go to Cornell and you have you know, a school that is devoted to labor relations and organizational studies. You have a school that's devoted to hotel administration. And I think that uh, the special the specialized schools really draw um, students who, who are interested in such diverse fields. Dartmouth is on the quarter system, which means we have a fall, winter, spring, and summer term. You can decide where you want to be in the world, essentially, and what you want to be doing. You have a certain number of off terms that you can use to either get an internship or go travel or study abroad and learn a new language. And for prospective students about to make their college decisions, these current students offer words of advice. I would definitely advise talking to however many random students you can. So if you're walking up and down on the walkway, just pull a student out to the side. What don't you like about this school? What do you love about this school? Campus culture is so important. The, the, the big X factor is how people on the campus, and that's not just students, that's faculty, that's staff, that's, that's everyone, how they all fit together. Definitely have an open mind throughout the process that there isn't one fit that um, no matter where you end up, there's definitely a way to, to get involved in different activities, to, to find different communities to be a part of. If you're at the caliber where you're considering schools like Penn or Yale or Stanford or Harvard or Princeton or whatever, it's, it almost doesn't matter where you go. And I know that I love Penn and I know that for me it was a great experience, but I know I'd have equally good friends and probably an equally good experience had I gone to any of the other comparable schools. To get a real taste of where you can fit in within the college I think is really important and the only way you're going to learn that is um, through talking to students that are at the school. To all of you prospective students, wishing you the best of luck. More specifically, wishing you lots of big envelopes. This is Jen Kramer reporting for YTV. Back to you in the studio. Thanks Jen. That was a look into the lives of current Ivy League students and their insights into the college decision-making process. For students anxiously awaiting the big day tomorrow, we wish you all the best. Next up, the cost of attending these Ivy League institutions is rising. Yale, in particular, will increase tuition by 4% next year, raising the price from $55,300 to $57,500. But Yale's financial aid budget will fall slightly from $120 million to $119 million. Despite rising costs and shrinking budgets, financial aid director Cesar Stolazzi said that he does not anticipate major changes to financial aid in the next academic year. President-elect Peter Salve told us that he does not expect the students to feel any effects from the sequestration in financial aid. If federal funding does decrease, Yale will compensate for those changes. However, there will be minor alterations for new and returning students next year. Expected self-help contributions will increase by $100, and aid packages could change mid-year for newly accepted students due to, quote, funding uncertainties at the federal level, unquote. Expected family contributions will not be affected. Yale is also considering dramatic changes to the way it distributes grades for undergraduates. 
In just days, a vote will be taken at the April faculty meeting on whether or not to change from letter grades to 100 point scale. This change would aim to address grade co compression. A preliminary report at the ad hoc committee on grading showed that 62% of grades awarded were in the A range. Last week, members of the committee that proposed these changes met with about 60 students in an open forum, staying in LC until 10 o'clock to answer questions. YCC Vice President Danny Abraham said that while he appreciated their time and patience, he felt they should ha have held forums when they began the proposal process last semester in order to fully solicit opinion on such a complex issue. A recent YCC poll of about 1,700 students showed that 79% were against the changes to a 100-point scale, believing it would have a negative effect on Yale's collaborative, academic, and social culture. In New Haven, potential candidates are still coming forward for the mayoral election in November. Nonprofit consultant Henry Fernandez is the most recent addition to the mayoral race ticket. He graduated from Yale Law in 94. Fernandez has supported nonprofits and liberal movements around the country, as well as projects in New Haven like Gateway College, the Schubert Theater, and the youth agency LEAP. Other new names in the race include Ward 10 Alderman Justin Alicker, Connecticut State Rep Gary Holder Winfield, and Sudiata Kulutsu. Fernandez is the only candidate not planning to use the Democracy Fund. New Haven's finance program for the mayoral race, because his late announcement will not give him time to use the system efficiently. Current Mayor DiStefano, who has sat in the mayor's seat for nearly two decades, announced earlier that this year he will not run for an 11th term. In more campus news, after winter break of Will Portman's freshman year, he wrote his parents a coming out letter. This week, Portman wrote again to show the personal side of the Senator Rob Portman story. Senator Rob Portman is the first Republican senator to endorse gay marriage. Portman supports his father's recent decision to support gay marriage and refutes accusations that his father waited two years too long to publicly support the union of same-sex couples. He cites his father's deliberation and understanding process for the delay, as well as his parental concern about keeping children out of the spotlight. Portman hopes that gay rights will move in the same direction of previous civil rights movements. He believes that gay rights may be the civil rights cause of the moment, but the movement fits into the larger historical story. Portman says he is proud to have a father who is now a part of that story. In sports news this week, Tony Reno, the new football coach, tightens the reins on his team, now declaring where football players can and cannot live. His policy was introduced in the beginning of the semester, and it prohibits football players from living off campus during their junior year. Reno denies that this decision is linked to the football team's participation in fraternities like Deke and Zeta Psi. Instead, Reno believes the rule will improve the boys' nutrition and academic standing. Exceptions will be handled on a case-by-case -case basis and in accordance with Yale's undergraduate re regulations, which allow a student to live off campus starting their junior year. March 20th marked the first day of spring, but the weather this past week begged to differ. Students' only confirmation of the season switch came from the official YCC announcement about the coveted Spring Fling 2013 lineup. The new official announcement released Thursday listed the full lineup, which also includes band Best Coast and DJ R.L. Grime. Students have known about one headliner, Macklemore and Ryan Lewis, since February 9th. A few weeks later, the student body received news that Group Love would be one of the other acts. The YCC declined to release the results of the Spring Fling survey, but this group of artists promises to make the annual concert quite a show. We will have to wait to see how Macklemore compares to T-Pain's performance. In two weeks, a Prohibition throwback bar called Ordinary will open at 990 Chapel Street. This building once welcomed visitors like President George Washington, President Abraham Lincoln, and Babe Ruth as part of the New Haven House Hotel. As early as 1858, this space operated at first as a speakeasy and then a bar, but the four new owners promised to create lasting change. The owner and manager of Casius, the manager's brother, and the owner of Micro Beer Bar in Hamden joined together to preserve the history of 990 Chapel keeping the original woodwork and staying true to old-style cocktails and imported craft beer. Drinks will partner with traditional bar food like meat pies, chocolate, and of course, Case's cheese. While Yale undergraduates are not the restaurant's target customers, the relaxed atmosphere and drink menu will likely draw many Yaleys, according to manager Sam Sobosinski. In other culture news, would you like a ticket to Hamlet? Well, so would lots of people on campus, but Hamlet sold out its entire run a week before it opened. It stars New Haven native and Yale College and drama school graduate Paul Giamatti, who's also an Academy Award nominee. 
Giamatti's name recognition plus the popularity of Hamlet helped make it the rep's most commercially successful show in 11 years, according to Drama School Senior Associate Director of Communications, Stephen Padla. This is the rep's largest show of the season, with nearly double the cast of any other production. This impressive show will also welcome 3,000 New Haven High School students in the audience as part of the Will Power Educational Initi Initiative. The rep offers specially priced tickets to local schools. For many attendees, this will be their first exposure to Shakespeare on stage. For this special launch edition, we introduce you to all four of our YTV anchors. We now pass the broadcast to Danielle and Lily, who will introduce our staff and their original broadcast content. Hi, I'm Danielle Trubo. And I'm Lily Fast. We've seen profile after profile on President-elect Peter Salve. But what about the man replacing him as provost? Reporters Frida Yelm and Caroline Pringle introduce you to the new provost, Benjamin Pollock. Thanks, Danielle and Lily. As Peter Salovey steps into the role of university president, there are big shoes to fill in the provost's office. Professor Benjamin Pollock is just the man to fill them. We spoke to him about the new challenges he'll face as provost and what he hopes to bring to one of Yale's top administrative roles. After dropping his kids off at school every morning, Professor Pollock can be found in his new office preparing for a day of meetings as he trains to take on the position of provost. I'm a freshman right now, so I'm asking questions like, I got this email, saying uh, Yale should do this and am I meant to make that decision or anyway right I'm asking really naive questions. So Peter's working with me on a daily basis both because he's the ex-provost and because he's my boss. I'm meeting with uh, President Lavin roughly weekly. It's very important that I am able to recognize the things I don't understand and allow people who do understand it better to guide those decisions. So we want uh, the big decisions of this university to be informed by people who have evidence and knowledge of those areas. Pollock's area of expertise is economics, a subject he has taught at Yale for almost 20 years. Perhaps the most significant change for Professor Pollock will be leaving the classroom behind for the Warner House. I've always taught since I came to Yale in 1994, and I've always taught at a fairly large scale. So this is Game Theory Economics 159. I took Game Theory with Ben Pollock. But the class was probably my favorite class at Yale. Um, all the other lectures were very engaging. I found that I learned a lot. I like teaching. Everyone knows I like teaching. And teaching kept things kind of real for me. You know? So I'm going to miss that. We're going to miss him here. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, he's done a lot of good things for us. I think that it's pretty tough to lose him. Um, was a really great professor. Like most professors, I am a perpetual student. I'm really getting to be a student again. Although Professor Pollock will no longer be interacting with students in the classroom, he plans to maintain a dialogue with the student body as provost. Peter has set up, when he was provost, and I'll continue with this, uh, a fairly regular meeting with a group of students, just to hear from some students about student concerns. That's enormously important. So any day that there's a uh, class that works better, because we've been able to install better classroom equipment and the teachers are even more committed to teaching, or any day in which we admit another unbelievably great student. Uh, these, are, these are wins for us. I think universities are incredibly exciting places. You've got incredibly exciting students, you've got incredibly exciting research going on. And suddenly you realize, you know, at least on paper, um, I'm, quote, second in command of this, and that's pretty scary, actually, because what's going on in these places is fantastic. He's very, very, very passionate about making things better. So he works really hard. I, mean, I really care about Yale, and I care about the things Yale stands for. It's about teaching and research, and that's really at our core mission, and uh, more than our core mission, it's, it's, it's who we are. Now, what do I bring? Um, I hope a sense of humility that, that my role is really just um, depending on everyone else, and hoping we can guide things in the right direction. Thanks. It's an exciting time as both Pollock and Salave prepare for their roles and the possibilities for Yale under their leadership. We now move to a story about a girl named Emmy who came to Yale and found her voice through spoken word. Olivia Pavko Giaccia is in our newsroom with this story. Olivia? Thanks, Danielle and Lily. Davenport freshman Emmy Mahmoud was born in Sudan and came to America when she was three. Growing up, she struggled to reconcile the war-torn landscape that much of her family was still living in with the relative quiet of suburban Pennsylvania. 
Now, she uses spoken word as a tool, not only to understand her own emotions, but also as a way to educate others. Every day, I go to school with the weight of dead neighbors on my shoulders. The worst thing about genocide isn't the murder, the politics, or the hunger, or the government-paid soldiers that chase you across borders and into camps. It's the silence. But what does it matter? I've seen 16 ways to stop a heart. I was born in Sudan. Uh, I've lived in Philadelphia most of my life. And uh, my entire family is from Darfur. And a lot of people at Yale do not know anything about Darfur. A lot of people all over the world don't know anything about Darfur. This is something that consumed basically my entire childhood and my entire life. The reason that I started with poetry is one of the things that I was most comfortable with when I was small. Uh, just making rhyming couplets. And that was my poetry basically my entire life until I came here. I was privileged to see Emmy uh, even before she auditioned. I was like maybe one of the first people to see her perform poetry at all because she um, she wrote some poems and I helped edit her and worked with her some stuff and it was you know in the beginning she was like she was good and she had some like really she had like some really strong writing but her pieces overall weren't as good and just like to watch her evolve incredibly rapidly over you know like six months now um, she had never written spoken word before uh, this fall. Emmy was always a poet in fact she jokes that she learned English at rhyme However, her first experience with spoken word was at Yale. The reason that spoken word was really revolutionary to me was because you cut out all of the extra things, all of the similes and whatnot that are just there because they're there to be devices. You cut it down to the core of the story, to the everything that you're feeling, and then you just go. The idea of it is that you don't just make things pretty, you say things how they are. Now, I say things way more directly than I did before. And the thing is, I also found out a lot of things about myself, like why it is that I smile all the time. Because if you don't smile, you cry. That's just how it is in my culture. She never stops being Emmy, which like I love. Sometimes, some, I mean like sometimes I'm just like, like oh, Emmy, stop. Because she's just like, it's like so much like happiness. Yeah, I think we had, like with the Sudan poem, when she first tried doing it, she would be smiling yeah. throughout it. Oh, yeah, just sort of like forced her, and, uh, and we have the one piece where like, I mean, you are not, I mean, in this piece, you need to realize that. Oh, so, yeah, we had to, we had, we had to work with her to make her perform with the weight of her words. Yeah. So once you figure out how you're feeling about something, and you learn how to convey that to other people, if you use spoken word the right way, then, as my friend Sean always says, then you could change one person and that would be enough. Her piece is just incredibly powerful and people afterwards just like, wow, like I really felt that. Um, so it's been incredibly special and I feel very lucky to have gotten to see Emmy uh, just like, just become better and better and better um, and like, just speak truth all the time. People don't want to be sad. I never wanted to be sad. I never chose to be sad. Why am I making other people sad? But it's not about sadness. It's about truth. It's really the nitty gritty of it. It's just about truth. Scarlet footprints on the floor. I remember waking to the sound of hushed voices in the night, eshed with the kind of sorrow that turns even the loudest dreams to ash. And it was impossible to believe in anything. Fear is the coldest thing in the desert. Fear! is the coldest thing in the desert. Fear is the coldest thing in the desert and it burns you, bows you down to half your height and owns you and no one hears you. Cause what could grow in the desert? Anyway. At her most recent poetry slam, Emmy was named best rookie. It looks like this Yale has not only found her voice, but knows how to use it. This has been Olivia Pafko Jacha and Isabel McCullough reporting for YTV. Back to you. Emmy and the Spoken Word Traveling Team will be en route to New York next week for Nationals. To see more of Emmy and hear the Spoken Word Team's stories, look out for their April showcase. Bulldog fans don't always show up to support the Blue and White, but when they do, they enjoy some of the most unique and impressive sporting venues in the nation. Tonight, Georgiana Wegman and Kevin Kucharski look into how Yale's athletic facilities have been revived during the Levin presidency. Georgiana? Thanks, Danielle and Lily. Twenty years ago, Yale's athletic complex was in dire need of attention. Fast forward to today, 
and Yale boasts some of the finest sporting venues across the country. While some have criticized the Levitt administration for a lack of attention to athletics, there's no denying that many of Yale's facilities have seen drastic improvements during his presidency. When he was hired in 1994, athletic director Tom Beckett could see that there was a lot of work to be done. Nineteen years ago when I arrived here at Yale, I would say that the facilities were less than what we would hope they would be. It was, I don't want to say a total state of disrepair, but it was less than what we wanted for Yale. Levin and Beckett soon allied in the effort to address the crumbling state of Yale's athletic infrastructure. One of the things that President Levin asked of us when I arrived was to do a study of all pieces he would like to get a report on. We got back to him probably within six to eight months after he asked for that and gave him a full menu of things that we would like to address. And I will tell you that during our 19 years together, President Levin and mine, we have been able to check off nearly every one of those major project facilities that uh, happened to be on that initial list. By all accounts, the improvements have gone above and beyond. In addition to making the student-athlete experience more comfortable, they have also opened new doors to competition. The renovation of the Coleman Heyman Tennis Center, completed in 2009, has allowed the team to participate in tournaments it did not have access to before. Where do I begin? It's, it's been incredible. So the first year of operation, we hosted the Intercollegiate National Indoors. So this is one of three national events, and we hosted in our first year. Because we hosted, we got players into the tournament as wild cards. And both the men and women's players who got in uh, won matches, which was fantastic. The list of completed projects is exhaustive. The Coleman Heyman Tennis Center, the Gilder Boathouse, and Reese Stadium were expanded significantly. The Brady Squash Center, Ingalls Rink, and the Smilo Field Center received much-needed updates. And the Ace Israel Fitness Center, the Landman Center, and DeWitt Family Field, the home of the softball team, were created entirely from scratch. The icing on the cake was a $30 million investment in the Yale Bowl. And these are only some of the changes that have been made. Reese Stadium has improved tremendously. I think the best way to explain it is that it went from bleachers to a facility. Before we couldn't have pregame talks out there, there weren't locker rooms. I don't even recall there being bathrooms. I remember running to the porter potty um, if we needed anything. The renovations have also lured top athletic talent to Yale. My first recruiting class after this was built was the fourth ranked recruiting class in the country. And that never would have happened without this facility. The facilities you have are, you know, make a tremendous impact to 17, 18 year old kids making a decision. It's a huge positive in the recruit, recruiting process. While Levin's administration has the final say on which projects are undertaken, his approval is only the first step in a long process toward completion. But the most crucial component of any project is fundraising, and that falls into the hands of the athletic department. A final decision is made by the officers of the university, chief among them, obviously, is the president. And then from there, you, you work to raise the funds uh, to, to make it happen. Beckett usually directs the fundraising efforts himself, making calls and visits to alumni across the country. Tom Beckett had done a lot of work to uh, get all these courts named, and he would call and he would go visit with alumni. So Tom was the driving force of getting it done. Although Beckett leads the way in fundraising, Levin has proven essential to the effort at times. Oh, it's absolutely the president has been very helpful. He has made any number of calls for us and actually has gone to visit alums uh, to inform them of a project and actually make the request of an alum to help us with the funding of it. Absolutely. Beckett says Yale's deeply rooted drive for excellence in all areas will continue to push forward the ongoing transformation of Yale's athletic infrastructure. I think it's important that Yale continues to build the infrastructure of all things at Yale. Yale talks about its desire for excellence, and that's in the DNA of this university. And that's what we want to see happen 
for our students, regardless of what it is they're passionate about, we want to give them the very best. As the torch passes from Levin to Salovey, there is still more work to be done, including the stalled renovation of Payne Whitney Gym. But if the next 19 years are as productive as the last, then Yale's athletic facilities are headed in the right direction. This has been Georgiana Wagman and Kevin Kacharski for YTV. Back to you. Thanks, Georgiana. Glad that Yale Athletics is getting some items checked off the Beckett list of renovations. The New Haven Free School offers classes free of grades and expenses, giving local New Haven residents the opportunity to learn about topics ranging from fermentation to improv. Patrice Bowman brings us a closer look. Patrice? Thanks. If you walk down to the corner of 212 College Street, you'll find the People's Art Collective. The People's Art Collective, or PAC, is an activist group that, according to their website, quote, addresses human injustices in New Haven with art. At this building, the organization's latest project runs from March 4th until April 21st. Since November of last year, New Haven Free School has held classes by pairing a variety of volunteer teachers with those who are eager to learn. It started as a collaborative project of artists and activists who are working at the People's Arts Collective. So some of the teachers are just like friends of ours or acquaintances or people that we've met around New Haven. Some of the teachers are, are folks who have reached out to us. There are just so many people in the community that have amazing skills and who are ready to share and willing to share. Some of the unique classes offered include backyard poultry raising and, for those who want to sharpen their comedic timing, long-form improv comedy taught by Eliza Caldwell. I got really big into it in college. Um, I was in two improv groups. Well, I've been wanting to do an improv class for quite some time, and I came across the free school and I was like, yes. That's it. <laughs> Although some students had their reservations about performing in front of others, once everyone started improvising, <laughs> laughter filled the basement. It was, you know, it was nice to have a group of people in a similar age uh, just kind of hang around, not a lot of pressure, not a lot of anxiety factors of minimal. The free school also offers a welcoming space for the LGBTQ community to discuss the intersection of art and gender in the course, Queer Art, Thought, and Action. At his first class, Yel Numnai, Kenneth Reyes, asked his students to introduce um, themselves. I'm Elizabeth. I am a lapsed poet. Um, I am here because I'm very lonely, um, and I'd like to change the temperature of this room. Soon, everyone put marker and crayon to paper in order to define queer personally. For me, it's like a kind of responsibility. We are responsible for our behavior, our presentation, how we treat other people, how we interact in and within institutions. In an effort to reclaim queerness, the students drew posters in order to make a statement. <laughs> they're, they're sort of their angle of, you know, it's people are learning and sharing skills, but it's much more communal than a classroom really appealed to me. Although free school has made a positive impression on those involved, there is still room for expansion and increased outreach to more people. In the next like month or so, we're working on getting a screen printer set up here and a dark room and different sort of like making stations. There's perhaps potential work to be done in terms of um, attracting and bringing in Yale students who might be more hesitant. For now, not only has free school provided well, education and fun I for its participants, but also an <laughs> opportunity for yeah. Yaleys to interact more with the residents of New Haven. Free school allows people in the area to mingle with others who they wouldn't normally mingle with. Like if they go to Yale, probably they only see Yale students, but you come here and you get people of different ages, different backgrounds. Um, so I think that's awesome. For Yaleys and non-Yaleys alike, the New Haven Free School offers stress-free education. No tuition, no grades, no exams, and no section jerks. Just the joy of learning. This has been Patrice Bowman and Nicole Levy for YTV. Back to you. And our last story tonight brings you highlights of Cody Pomerantz's interview with Professor Akil Amar. To see the full interview, please visit the features page of YaleDailyNews.com slash YTV.
Cody. Today we are joined for this week's segment of Everybody Has a Story by Professor Akil Reed Amar, who is the Sterling Professor of Law and Political Science at Yale University. He is an expert in constitutional law, having been cited in, in over 20 Supreme Court cases. And he is the author of multiple books on the United States Constitution, including America's Constitution, a biography, and most recently, America's Unwritten Constitution, the precedents and principles we live by. Professor Amar, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So there's, you know, there's this two big cases that were just argued before the Supreme Court concerning a very hot button issue, same-sex marriage. Yep. Uh, before we get into the specific oral arguments and the specifics of the, the cases, I just want to start very broadly. Is there a fundamental right to marriage? Absolutely. Uh, the Supreme Court has uh, recognized marriage as a fundamental right in over a dozen cases. I think uh, I, heard, I heard the number 14 uh, a couple of times mentioned as, as uh, the number of citations in uh, Supreme Court case law to the f uh, fundamental nature of of marriage as a right, and this is um, a reminder that not all fundamental rights are expressly enumerated, are listed in the Constitution. That's partly what I was trying to talk about in the unwritten Constitution. The Ninth Amendment says that um, uh, we shouldn't uh, deny or disparage, disrespect rights that aren't enumerated. Um, the Fourteenth Amendment, rights of the people. The Fourteenth Amendment says that there are privileges and immunities of citizens that no state should abridge, um, but it doesn't list, itemize, doesn't itemize all of those rights. And so we have to figure out what those privileges and immunities of citizens are, what those rights of the people are. And here's one we, we can find out what they are. We can look to how the people actually think uh, and live. Is, is the court, if they make a sweeping ruling about gay marriage, is the court being impatient of democratic change that is going on and using, extrapolating something that, that's not actually in the original text? Well, it's a fair question. Um, let's work through the different elements. One big question is how we count um, the nature of, how we measure democratic change. If you look at number of states only nine recognize same-sex marriage. Should we factor in the population of the states? Should big states count for more than small states? And if so, how might that affect the analysis? Are the states that have recognized it bigger or smaller than average? Should we look not just at laws on the books, but how the laws are actually enforced? It turned out that there was a time in American history when a lot of laws criminalized same-sex behavior, but those laws were almost never enforced against private consensual conduct. So, should we look at just the number of laws or how they're actually enforced? Should we look at poll data? And here it's very dramatic because the American people are way out ahead of actual state practice. In California, in 2008, they voted for Proposition 8 that said no gay marriage, but I'm I'll give you five to one odds that if California, I'll bet a lot of money, that if California were re-voting today, they would vote for same-sex marriage. In fact, they voted for Jerry Brown, a Yale Law School graduate, as their governor, and Kamala Harris, um, their attorney general, who ran on a platform that they wouldn't enforce Proposition 8. That was a more recent election. So one question is, um, if we're looking for unenumerated rights, um, rights of the people, how do we measure what the people think and believe? number of states, laws um, as they're actually enforced, poll data, and, and Scalia might say, well, the polls might change. I don't think so. I'm willing to bet them a lot of money because people your age believe in gay rights and they're not going to change. And the people who don't believe in gay rights are basically just as Scalia's age and newsflash, they're going to die first. You name Justice Kennedy uh, had an interesting point when, when he talked about DOMA. His problem was more with federalism. Exactly. He said, you are at a real risk, quote, you are at a real risk of running into conflict with what has always been thought to be the essence of the state police power, which is re to regulate marriage, divorce, and custody. Is he right here? Do states, and, and only states, have the prerogative to define marriage for themselves? And if so, would that make any federal definition of marriage, even if it includes same-sex couples, run into federal problems? federalism problems. I love Justice Kennedy on a personal level. I count him a close friend. He's been 
extremely generous to me and my family, but I respectfully disagree with his federalism objection. And you put your finger on it. What if Congress passed a civil rights law, human rights law, saying we recognize same-sex marriage, and not just for federal purposes. Suppose they went even further, said not only do we recognize federal marriage for Social Security and income tax um, and, and veterans' purposes, um, and military and, and, and federal military purposes. We insist that every state recognize same state marriage because we think there's a fundamental right to same sex marriage uh, under the 14th Amendment, under our power to affirm civil rights. I would think that Congress has that power, just as Kennedy has been more skeptical of congressional power to vindicate um, human rights under the, the Reconstruction Amendments. So if DOMA is a problem, I think it's a problem because it violates equality, not because it violates federalism. Professor Amara, thank you for joining us. Thank you, pal. And thank you for joining us. I'm Cody Pomerantz. This has been YTV. Everybody has a story. Back to you in the studio. Thank you for watching our very first YTV broadcast. We hope you have a great week, and we look forward to seeing you next Sunday at 5.